Welcome to 90s Gay, where we take a deep dive into queer art and culture from the golden era of the 90s. On this episode, we chat with creative genius, Mr. Vincent Patterson. Now, while you may not recognize his name, his work includes some of the most iconic moments in pop culture history. We're talking Madonna's Blonde Ambition World Tour, as seen in her groundbreaking documentary, True of Air, plus her legendary Vogue performance dressed in Marie Antoinette drag on the MTV VMAs, even Robin Williams' dance scene in The Birdcage. Remember that one? Now, these were huge breakthroughs where the world saw gay culture and gay characters being brought into the forefront. We start this episode with Vincent's entrance into the industry, working with Michael Jackson, for whom he created the legendary Smooth Criminal. I love it. Well, Vincent, it's so nice to be talking to you today. And it goes without saying, I know, because I'm well aware of your career, what a legend and an icon you are in the dance community and in pop culture. But for people who aren't aware maybe of the hand that you've had in just the world of entertainment. I'm hoping that today we can touch on a whole bunch of stuff. Um, taking it back to the nineties, cause a lot of that, a lot of um, what we'll be talking about will be that period. What do you think of when you think of the nineties? The eighties. Oh yeah, we'll get there. We'll ancient, get there. Don't worry. ancient history. We'll get, <laughs> we'll get back to the eighties. Don't worry about it. But thinking of the nineties, what images flash into your mind when you think of that decade? Um, well, for me personally, I mean, I started it off thinking of creating a piece for Madonna for as a Marie Antoinette Vogue for MTV Awards that became kind of viral before there was such a thing as viral. Um, and uh, and also, uh, you know, having some other fun projects that I did, like um, Dancer in the Dark with Björk, the movie from Lars von Trier, and, uh, and also The Birdcage that I choreographed. Uh, uh, for Mike Nichols and uh, Fossey, 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 Michael Kidd, Michael Kidd, Michael Kidd, Madonna, Madonna. <laughs> That's what I think of as the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. We'll rewind then. Okay. Back to the 80s, because obviously that's where you first made your name as a dancer. Um, dancing with yeah. Michael Jackson, that is the ultimate dream for any dancer. He's the pinnacle of who you could potentially dance with. And you were right there doing the knife fight in Beat It as the zombie in Thriller, the most iconic music videos. How did your collaboration with Michael Jackson as a dancer first start? Well, um, Michael Peters, who was a choreographer for Beat It and for Thriller, uh, was a personal friend of mine and kind of a mentor. Um, I took a lot of classes from him and we worked together quite a bit as dancers on television shows. Then he wanted to get into choreography, so I started helping him out and assisting him in classes. And we put a workshop together after uh, at the end of the evenings. And we'd work from like 10 o'clock to two o'clock with about 10 or 12 dancers, just for Michael Peters to have the opportunity to explore choreography. So when these projects started coming into him, um, I was kind of assisting him in class anyway. So he said, well, why don't you come and assist me uh, on these on Beat It first? And uh, he said, but you're going to have to audition because Michael Jackson, this is like, it's all new for him and he wants to be in the room and he wants to pick people. So the fun part for me was um, I had trained as an actor for many years before I started dancing. So I knew Michael Peters told me that Beat It was about gangs. And I thought, all right, well, you know, I'm an actor, so I'm going to dress up kind of like a gang leader, or gang person or something, you know, all the other guys came in in like stretch pants and, and, and stretch tank tops in neon colors. <laughs> and, 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 and uh, what, 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 what do we call uh, Leg warmers. Yeah. They were like these things that you put on your bottom of your, God knows for really what. Gang, they were not really gang attire. <laughs> Absolutely. Like a fashion statement, really nothing more. But, um, so when I came in almost dressed exactly like what I wore in the music video. Oh, wow. um, I kind of let my, my beard grow, my, my my hair grow on my face a little bit for about three days. And I wore an earring and um, greased my hair a little bit. And um, I had on, uh, you know, like baggy jeans kind of and a T-shirt. And um, and so I noticed when I came into the room that and I, we started dancing, I, I could watch. I could see Michael Jackson up there standing next to Michael Peters. And he was saying, who's that guy? Who's that guy over there? Well, of course, it was obvious. I mean, I was dressed so differently than all the other dancers. And plus, I 
I could dance really well. And, and also I knew Michael Peters work very well. So, um, I was cast as the gang leader and uh, opposite Michael Peters. And it was a fantastic beginning to a 17 year plus relationship with Michael Jackson. Um, it began, we began to kind of get to know each other a little bit in rehearsal space. And he was, you know, this was the beginning of the Michael Jackson that we know now. I mean, he was stepping away from the Jackson five and trying to find his own identity. And, uh, really to be put into Michael Peter's hands and then I'll pat myself on the back, my hands, I think was some of the wisest decisions that he ever made, Michael Jackson. And, uh, yeah. What was your perception? So that's what was your perception of Michael Jackson prior to starting to work with him? Were you um, a fan of his music? Were you aware of sort of? I guess this is coming uh, up the wall. Well, I was uh, I was aware of Michael Jackson. I liked the music of the Jackson Five. You know, I like especially like "Shake Your Body Down to the Ground." I love that song, and um, you know, but he was a little kid, you know, and I, I didn't really think too much about him. I mean, it wasn't like I, I was, uh, he was, a, I was starstruck or something. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, but it, I knew he was the voice behind the Jackson five. And it was interesting yeah. to me that he was going to start out on his own. And Billy so Jean very was, much, this is very much the moment. What? This was very much the moment of his star exploding. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, Billie Jean, which was the first one that he did on his own, was okay. It was all right. Nothing special. But then he kind of came out with the Motown. He appeared on that Motown special doing that moonwalk and it changed everything. It changed the entire landscape. But, you know, the funny thing is, Joel, when he came into the dance studio, he only had one older man walk him in. Nobody stopped him in the hallways. You know, I mean, people didn't really recognize him at that point. And, uh, you know, he was very sweet. He had very little to say. He didn't really make much comments about the choreography or anything. He just learned the work and really worked very hard. And then the next day he came back and worked with the rest of the dancers and Michael Peters and myself. And, um, yeah, he was just, a, he was just a sweet young guy, very innocent. I mean, what, what shocked me as things started to, happen even in rehearsal was you know this guy was like hi i'm michael jackson nice to meet you you know and then the music would turn on and this guy would fucking explode i mean he would just it was i don't even know how to describe it dancing next to him in beat it when we actually shot it as i'm talking to you right now you can see i've got goosebumps you know but right, dancing yeah. next to I'm serious. Dancing next to him, the hair on your arms would stand up. He was so powerful that you got sucked into this magnetic energy that heightened your performance as well and uh, and everybody's performance. And just to think that these were um, the principal dancers that surrounded him were trained dancers. And here he was a, basically an untrained dancer and making us work our asses off to keep up with him. I mean, it was absolutely a phenomenal experience. Yeah. Just incredible. What do, you, what do you put it down to? He was just instinctual, right? With the way that he moved and his performance quality. It was just, he he was so well, connected to the music, right? Absolutely. That's, that's part of it. Um, you know, he did have some training. It was tap predominantly that he trained in as a kid and growing up with the Jackson 5. And he did some choreography. Of course, the Jackson 5 did some choreography. So he was a little bit aware about learning steps and learning that. But um, he never had any real formal training at all. So it was that was the other thing that was so fascinating that he came into the room with all of these trained dancers. And you never knew that he hadn't trained as a dancer for years and years like the rest of us in the room. Phenomenal. And so, so much of it was instinctual. Absolutely. But he worked very hard to take on Michael Peters or my or anyone else's choreography because it didn't come easily to him. Yeah. He but seemed like he worked his ass off, worked his ass off. like a He crazy seemed guy. like a study, like someone who would absolutely study and nitpick yeah. the movement no. to be able to. 
No, no. But he was so precision oriented and his mind, he was such a perfectionist that like a jump for a second to smooth criminal. Uh, when I taught him the movements to smooth criminal, he would stand in front of the mirror. He stood in front of the mirror the first time I taught him after he got the basic movement. He said, Vince, I just want to do this in this room by myself with you in here. Don't let anybody come in. Okay. And he stood in front of that mirror for like three and a half hours, Joel, just doing this simple step, you know, for three and a half hours or so until it was so perfect that you actually thought it was instinctual. You thought that he created it, you know, yeah, right. which partially is a big problem because that's why so many people don't realize that I did some choreography with him. You know, they all think it was him because he looked so damn good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is close to you. But yeah, when it comes to getting the credit, I guess this is why this this type of moment and your book, which we'll get to as well, is so important because it shines yeah. light on the man behind so much of that legacy. <laughs> um, tell me about transitioning from dancer to choreographer for Michael. How did that call come about? And were you ready to step? I mean, clearly you were, but when you look at the work, but did you have any reservations when that call came in of like, oh, I'm going to be holding the reins now? Well, um, yeah, a, a couple of different answers here. So um, being the assistant choreographer, um, what you do is Michael Peters and I would teach Michael Jackson and the dancers the choreography. But then Michael Peters would kind of leave the room and it would be up to me to work personally with Michael Jackson to be sure that he knew the movement precisely and exactly the way Michael Peters had created it. So that intimate time, we began to chat and talk a little bit and, you know, play around and joke and have a good time. That was on Beat It. So when Thriller came, uh, he was a little bit more open and, uh, you know, he was now had Beat It had gone through the roof and it kind of sent him into the stratosphere. And now Thriller was the next big thing coming up. And we really, those of us who danced and beat it before it came out, we had no idea that it was going to be anything. Honestly, we just thought it was going to be just a simple little thing. We didn't really know even what music videos were about at that time. Mm. It was so new. But when Thriller came, I worked with him more intensely one-on-one -on -one and built up a little bit more of a relationship. So after that, a couple years after that, I was sitting home and I got a phone call and it was like, oh, hi, is Vincent there? I was like, yeah, who's this? It's Michael Jackson. I said, no, I don't think so. Who the fuck is this? It's Michael Jackson. It is Michael Jackson. I said, no, it isn't Michael Jackson. And if you don't fucking tell me who it is, I'm going to fucking hang up the phone right now. Oh he said, Vince, it's me. It's really me. I was like, oh, my God, Michael, I'm so sorry for saying fuck. Please, I'm so sorry, man. You know, and he said, are you are you? are you home? Are you doing anything right now? I said, no. And he was at a recording studio around the corner in Hollywood. I live in Hollywood. And uh, so he said, could you come over? So I went over and he played for me. We talked a little bit, but right away he wanted to play me just the music that he had for Smooth Criminal. He had only one section, Annie, are you okay? Annie, are you okay? Are you okay, Annie? That was the only lyrics he had at that point. So we listened to the music. We hung out for a while. We talked about a bunch of things and uh, and then came back, listened to the music some more, and he handed me a cassette, you know, those things that people used to have, those little square plastic box things, and uh, ancient history. And um, I said, oh, do you want me to dance, dance in, the, in, in the video? What, what, do you, what do you want? He said, no, I want you to, I want you to listen to the music and, and, and let the music tell you what it wants to be. I want you to conceive it. I want you to choreograph it and, and I want you to direct it. And I was kind of flabbergasted. I, I, I speechless to be honest. And I left and I thought two things. First of all, oh my God, <laughs> that was the first one. Like, I can't believe this. I mean, after I did beat it, I got, uh, musicians wanted to have a little bit of movement in their videos. So, I, I dealt with some rock bands who called me because they thought I looked like that guy in the video and they wanted me to help them out and choreograph, you know, like Van Halen, um, a band called LTD, uh, David Lee Roth, okay. a few other people, you know? And so I had 
dabbled in the choreography, but not really, you know, just a little bit here and there. So I was not prepared for Michael Jackson to ask me to conceive and choreograph a project and direct it as well. So I first called Michael Peters because we were best friends. And unfortunately, that kind of severed our relationship. Um, he accused me of trying to take over his position with Michael Jackson. And I told him very sadly that that wasn't the way it was, that he called me and I had no idea why he asked me to do it, but this seemed to be my fate and I was definitely going to do it. I was asked to do it. And so of course I was going to take it. Um, so he just kind of stopped being my friend for quite a while and eventually things came back, but it took a while. It was very touchy and sensitive there for a bit. Yeah, right. Um, but yeah, it was tough. So I came home and I listened to the music for a couple of days and I got these ideas in my head about what I thought it could be. This Chicago nightclub late at night underground, a little wild and crazy and, and uh, called him back, called MJ back and said, this is what I'm thinking. And he said, come on over to my house. I came, went over to his house and we talked about it and he loved it. And he said, okay, so I'm going to be working on my album. So you do the casting. I trust you. You do the casting. I'm going to give you a sound stage where we're going to shoot it. And, you know, you bring the dancers in there and put it together. And, and I'm going to give you a video camera and you shoot what you're rehearsing and come and show me every couple of days. And that's basically what I did. I started out with 10 dancers and I would shoot things and, then I would go and show him and he would say, uh, oh, I like it. I really like it, you know, but I think you need some more dancers, don't you? And I was, I said, sure, of course I do. So, oh, well, go get 15 more dancers. Okay, Mike, great, you know, and then I would come back and show him what I, I think you need more dancers, don't you? Yeah, Mike, I do. Eventually, I think we had 70. We started out with 10 and I think it was about 70. And he would say like, this is really good, but I think you need some more music, don't you? I said, yeah, Mike, I do. So he would like extend the track. So I had more music to play with. Um, unfortunately, he obviously, huh? had total, he obviously had total belief and faith and um, confidence in what you were creating and your abilities to do. So the fact that he wasn't sort of like um, micromanaging the situation or imposing too much what? of his own control like that. Do you think that, that might be part of what allowed that magic to happen? It was just free. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that because we had gone through those two prior projects together, he kind of had a sense of me. He knew that, I mean, when we were on the set for Thriller, for instance, you know, I it was late at night and cold and wet and, um, you know, and I would go in and I would pull him out of the trailer and I'd say, come on, Mike, come and hang out with the dancers. Well, I'm, I don't know, Vince. I, I'm too shy. You know, I, I don't you know. Come on, Michael, come on, let's go, come talk, talk with the dancers. And he would just come then with me and just hang out with the dancers while they were all talking. And, you know, and I think that he realized that I really liked him, you know, as a, not only as an artist, but as a human being. And, and I think he appreciated that I was a nice guy and that I was sensitive to his situation and tried to make him as comfortable as possible. I think that had a lot to do with it, to, to tell you the truth. But it was quite shocking that he gave me that freedom from not knowing anything. And I had nothing to really show him to give him that inspiration to think of me as the person to put that together. You know. Now, eventually I didn't get to direct it because it started out just as a short film, uh, Moon, a smooth, smooth criminal, but then it became Moonwalker. And when it became Moonwalker, um, they brought in Colin Chilvers to direct, oversee the whole project of Moonwalker. But the good thing was he was a really nice man, Colin. And because I had done sort of storyboards, because I thought I was going to be directing it, I had done storyboards and I had done a video storyboard with what I had. Um, he was very, very respectful of what I had put together. And um, Pretty much, you know, I stood by him the whole time and it, it was really a co-directing situation, but he, he officially, he, he is the director. You know. Right. For the, for the larger film. But really, yeah. well, really, and, Smooth Criminal is the part that everyone remembers of that film, let's be real. Right. 
But I mean, he did direct Smooth Criminal, sure. um, you know, officially, officially. Sure. But sure. And then the moment, <laughs> the moment, I mean, Michael's arguably, or probably not even arguably, the most iconic artist of all time. And when you think of the visual of Michael, you picture the lean. Tell me about the lean and where ah. this, line, this lean came from. Well, you know, I knew Michael liked crazy shit. I knew, I knew he loved crazy shit. So I, I wanted to come up with some really fun things for him. So the first thing that I conceived is when he walks in the door and he flips the coin and it goes across the room and lands in the jukebox, you know. When I told him that idea, he was like, oh yeah, Vince, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about, you know. And then, and then the second thing that I had conceived was that, that staircase that drops down and he comes down the staircase because he was like, you know, um, how am I going to get down the staircase? And I said, uh, let's build, how am I going to get down from the second story? Well, let's have him build a staircase. You step on it and like magic, it goes like this and you walk down, you know, he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was always like a little kid, you know? So um, I wanted to do something mind boggling. Many years before I had seen a company, uh, Palabolus and they did, there was a, a, a guy and a girl and they did a piece where they came at, or the curtain opened up and they were on skis just, and the skis were into the floor, but huge, long mountain skis, snow skis. Mm -hmm. And they had the flexibility because of how they were in those, the, the shoes in the ski, in the skis to be able to do everything, to go every direction they wanted to go. And that was probably about, 10 years maybe before I did this, but that image stayed in my head. And I just felt at some point, I wanna do something like that somehow, but I didn't, I had never done anything where it could fit in, you know? And I brought it up to Michael and I said, I have this crazy idea, man, that I want you to, you know, do this, you and the guys that you're with to do this lean, and then you come back up. And he goes, well, how do we do it? I said, well, I'm gonna to talk to the, the, the technical guys here, the theater, old theater guys, you know, and I sat them down. There were about four guys. And, you know, these are these guys that are, they've been in the theater for like 300 years, you know, they know how to do everything. And I, so I started talking to them about this and, and um, so we decided on a way to do it where the, each dancer and Michael would have a harness under their clothing and they would be attached to these strings that went up to the ceiling and all the way across the room and each dancer had two guys and Michael had two guys. And when they would release the tension, the guys would go over. When they would pull, the tension would pull them back up. So we rehearsed it and rehearsed it and rehearsed it. So it worked so perfectly. So you have the wide shot with them going over and coming back. And then they do a move to go sideways and you cut to a close up and they're out. Then they're out of the strings, you know. Uh, and then we took the strings out in CGI, of course. Um, later when I directed the bad tour for Michael, um, he had some, uh, mechanics kind of, uh, patented that were in the stage floor and you could hook the heel of your shoe into it and do it, you know, that way. So, um, but originally it, it was really an inspiration in a off the wall way from a, a dance company called Palabolus. Yeah. That's how that crazy thing happened. Just magic. Just magic. And when you, yeah. think, um, I mean, if you go to the, um, the foyer of the Cirque du Soleil Michael tribute that's in Vegas at the moment, the statue in there is him in the lean. It's just the image that it pops into everybody's mind. And the assumption would be, oh, the assumption would be from the general public is that that's a billion dollar move that every time someone leans, you get a paycheck and so come to oh. find yeah, come to find that in, in this is something that you've been a huge advocate for is dancers' rights and choreographers' rights that that intellectual property, the credit and um, compensation sometimes hasn't, that hasn't been um, appropriate. Um, tell me a little bit no, about it. Has been. Tell me a little bit about yeah. the fight that you have um, taken up for, which is incredible on behalf of so many choreographers on protecting the work and creating that acknowledgement and that awareness. Yeah. Well, you know, um, yeah, uh, that's a lot of conversation. How, uh, uh, okay. So, um, choreographers who work on Broadway have a union 
and the union covers their copyright, their ownership of the work, uh, and the respect that the work will always be done exactly as they created it. Um, on the West Coast, choreographers who work in television, in film, in music video, in commercials, in pop tours, have no union. And consequently, we have nothing. What we're forced to sign in a contract whenever we work, and still it goes this way, is called a work for hire. What a work for hire means is that you're just hired, they give you a paycheck, and they own everything that you've done. They can do whatever they want with it. You have no say about anything. And this is what a group of us here are now trying to eliminate. Um, we have created a guild called the Choreographers Guild, CG, and it is for those choreographers who work in those mediums uh, because they've never been represented. Now, not represented by an agent, but I mean represented by a union, yes. and that's a completely different thing. So the problem was, and still is, if credit is a huge issue. If you have a successful background and you've done a lot of great work, your agents can oftentimes get you really good credit. I've been fortunate in the films that I've done, um, I have main title credit. And that's because the directors that I've worked with respect not only the contributions that I bring to them for that project, but also my history, what I've created in the past. So I've been very fortunate to get main title credit along with director, producer, cinematographer, you know, all the major players. But that only goes and only happens when you have a director who you've worked with or who likes working with you or whatever, you know. So we are trying to make some amendments here. We are trying to begin to get the society of filmmakers and creatives out here and the producers associations to recognize the work that we do, recognize the power not only creative power, but the financial power of what we bring in on projects, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, had, would it, had it not been for choreographers, so many million, multi, multi, multi-million, if not billion dollar movies would never have happened or not have been able to happen, you know. Yeah. But definitely we're constantly... Would, yeah, definitely would not constantly have over the legacy that they've had. Yeah, constantly overlooked, constantly forgotten, and constantly not credited. So the consequence of that is you see Michael Jackson and everything that Michael Jackson created with anybody, he got um, dual ownership or dual credit mm -hmm. choreographed by Michael Peters and uh, Michael Jackson beat it. Michael Jackson never choreographed a step of beat it. Choreography for Thriller, Michael Jackson, Michael Peters, um, Michael Jackson, may have said a comment like it would be wouldn't it be good if we put that step on this beat do you know what i mean so all of a sudden he has choreography credit for that one statement you know sure. with me in smooth criminal for example michael and i shared credit uh with another guy jeffrey daniel who came in and did some street work with some street guys in there but all that michael jackson did in that i'm not saying all but the choreography that michael jackson created for smooth criminal was only the moments, were only the moments that he was completely alone doing his own thing. Like for instance, for those people that know that short film, he comes in, he tosses the coin, he talks to some girls, he goes over to the bar, he goes up onto the stand where the musicians are and he starts to dance and sing. Well, that is completely him once he's up on that stage. That's his own choreography. I would never touch that, that's his own thing. So when he moves by himself, with nobody else involved, that's Michael Jackson. Whenever he moved with anybody else, that's another choreographer involved. But because it's Michael Jackson and because we have no unions, the way it comes down is they forget the second person and they only remember Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. So whether it's Pepsi campaigns that had the lean, whether it's video games that was all about Smooth Criminal, that was all my creation, remember, I saw not a penny. No credit, no penny, nothing, you know. If you think about, I'm going to go back to Thriller for a second, though. Michael Peters has passed away, but 
if you think that Michael Peters would get five cents for every time Thriller was played or the song was played or people heard it or tried to do the dance, he would have been a billionaire by now, you know? I mean, it's absolutely remarkable. Yeah. So right. it's a sad state of And know. rightfully so when I you mean, think about the, con the contribution that choreographers make to just that iconic yeah. imagery. It's, it's what flashes into your mind when you think of the music videos, the songs. Yeah. And the credit should be no different to, it's the same as a songwriter or a record producer, someone who's had a big hand in creating this incredible art should absolutely be profiting and get credit. Like it's, it's unbelievable that this is oh, yeah. the situation that we haven't moved on. Well, even in, even in the heyday of MTV, they would list the artist and they would list the director. The choreographer was never listed on any music video, no matter if, no matter how much dance was in the video. Uh, they just, we just weren't listed. It was only the uh, artist and title of the song, the artist and the director. So it was a, it was a huge injustice and it still is. And thank God there's some very powerful choreographers who are out there. I'm not really choreographing anymore. I just direct, but there are a lot of great choreographers who have a lot of clout and who are actually becoming producers. And because of that, they're able to um, have the power to make some of these changes. And those are the groups, that, that's the group of people that have now come onto this union called the Choreographers Guild. And hopefully we're gonna make some changes in the next couple of years. Yeah. Well, bravo to you for putting your weight behind it and your legacy behind it as well. Cause I think that's also what, when, when very easy to um, understand the argument and to side with the choreographers when you could use you and your work as an example and think that's crazy because you think Michael Jackson, you think of the dance, you think of the choreography. Well, exactly. And, and, and for instance, for instance, uh, you know, the Michael Jackson show in Vegas, Michael Peters and I have no credit. We have, no, we don't get one penny, you know, nothing, no residuals, nothing at all. Um, it's just, it's just so unfair, you know, and I'm not talking about just us and it's not just Michael Jackson. It's, it's everybody. Yeah. It's an industry know, it's across the board. Issue. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, again, bravo to you for taking up the fight on a more positive note, moving forward to the black or white video. Oh no, that's a, it's a positive note. The fact that the fact that something instigated the creation of a guild is a very positive note. So I'm, I'm very positive in my thoughts. And so, so are all of us involved in it. You know, we're not really griping and complaining because that's the way it has been. But what we're doing is trying to educate and inform. So people know that this is what has to change. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So black or white, when I think of another iconic video, I remember seeing it for the first time. Where were you when you saw Black or White for the first time? Did you get to see like little advanced snippets or did you watch the whole thing and have that same impact, I guess, that we all had of seeing it from start to end? Uh, I saw, no, I saw it privately with um, John Landis uh, first before I saw it on television. So, um, and that was very exciting. Um, but I saw it at home with a bunch of friends and uh, yeah, and we were ecstatic and it had the ending in it. It had the, you know, the, the, the whole crotch grab black cat. Uh, yeah. It was there before MTV pulled it. So uh, that was great. <laughs> yeah. And I love the, the use of the world dance and the cultural dance in black or white. Talk to me a little bit about that, about, cause that was Michael completely in, in my mind doing something we'd never seen him done, do before and maybe um, out of his comfort zone. I mean. Well, yeah, he, he called me and he said, hey, I'm, uh, well, he called me and again, he said, I'm gonna do a short film and I want you to choreograph it. And, you know, I said, okay. So I, I met him and we talked about it and he said, um, well, you know, I think it, it, it's black and it's all, it's, it's all about being black or white and all the peoples of the world. And I said, well, then why don't we make it about all the peoples of the world? And I create all these different pieces that reflect people all over the globe. And, and then he said to me, and I have to, <laughs> he was always a joker, I have to say. And he said, 
I love that idea. I love that idea. But maybe you could do a part about slave owners and the slaves. And I was, my, my jaw dropped and I said, what? And he went, ha, got you, got you, got you. <laughs> I thought, are you? Oh my God. It's like, here face, here face, you know. I thought, <laughs> I thought are you, do a piece about slavery in a Michael Jackson video? Are you kidding me? Anyway, he got me on that one. But that's kind of how it happened. And then I just started thinking, okay, let's try this, let's try this, let's try this. But what happened then was we went to shoot it and John Landis had had an idea that he was going to shoot all of these different pieces in the same kind of gray background. And we began to shoot the first one, which was the Thai piece, the girls were doing Thai dancing. And um, Michael came back into the room and he said, Vincent, come to my trailer. And I went to his trailer and he said, I can't do this. I can't have these dances in front of gray, a gray wall. He said, I, th th that's not what people expect from my short films. I, I can't do it. What am I going to do? So we just started talking together, the two of us. And, and I don't remember who started it, but we both just started playing together. Well, what about if it was out in, uh, by a freeway or what about if it's out by Vasquez rocks and the American Indians come storming over the hills and, and he got so excited and we had such a good time. And a cool thing I have to say about John Landis is, uh, you know, I called John, I asked him to come into the trailer and we sat and we told him the situation and, you know, he was absolutely egoless. He said, great. This is great. I love this idea. Let's do it. Let's, let's make it happen. So we took a break from the work and he found some location scouts and they got the locations for us and the choreography was already finished. So now it was just a matter of shooting the pieces in different locations. And that's, that's, that's what we did. It was really, really cool. And, you know, it was always so wonderful collaborating with Michael because he was so open. And if he asked you to do something, he totally trusted you and, just listen to what you had to say and respected honesty. Um, I would imagine, and I'm just guessing, but probably he didn't get a lot of honesty. You know, probably a lot of people were just kissing his ass and, you know, wanting something, but I never really wanted anything. I was happy when he called and, you know, if he didn't call, then he was for another reason. He was working with somebody else and I was off doing something else, but you know, I, I enjoyed every single project that we got to do together. And yeah, he's kind of like a little guardian angel that's around me all the time. So, you know, because so much of what happened with him and with Madonna gave me um, the visual history that allowed international directors and producers to call me and invite me to be part of projects. And had it not been for Michael and Madonna, it probably would never have happened. But because they were like right at the top of the game and I was doing everything for them, um, I was just kind of included in it and it changed my life completely. Incredible. Incredible. Another thing that you changed completely was the Super Bowl. Because prior to uh, Michael Jackson's Super Bowl halftime show, it was very much marching bands and little children singing and very basic kind of halftime shows. And then you and Michael turn it into this magical spectacle. Um, what are your thoughts on the Super Bowl halftime since then? And are there any that stand out as ones that you like? And what do you think about the way that the Super Bowl halftime has evolved over time? Well, I mean... It's always, um, it's always fulfilling to be groundbreaking. And uh, it's also always fulfilling to set a trend. Um, so I worked with Don Misher, who was the director. He called me in and he said, you know, listen, Michael's going to do this. I, he, he's interested, but I haven't convinced him. Uh, do you think you could talk to him about this? And I talked to Don and Don said, the thing that would be great, this is the point you should convince Michael about, is that there'll be people that'll see this show and the halftime show in places that he'll probably never tour. So he's giving himself an opportunity to be seen by a completely new audience. So that was kind of my selling point. And, you know, Michael really, I don't think he ever watched a, 
a Super Bowl game in his life. I, I could be wrong, but I don't think so. And um, and when I talked to him about that, he was like, OK, Vince, let's do it. Let's do it. So Don Mesher was, again, so sweet with me and said, OK, let's sit down and conceive this thing. What do you think it should be? So I came up with all this craziness of these impersonators appearing up on top of these jumbo screens. And um, I came up with the idea of Michael coming, jumping out, being propelled out of the from underneath the stage and staging that whole piece. And and a funny thing happened that um, when I directed the bad tour for him, his first tour, um, he had said to me at one point after uh, a couple shows, he said, um, you know what? I really I'd like I want to have a private moment. I said, what's a private moment, Mike? He goes, I just want to stand on the stage and not do anything. And I want to see what happens. And I said, for how long? Oh, just a couple seconds. I was like, okay. So he would. He started doing that in the bad tour. And he would be doing something and he would just stop. And people would scream and scream and scream. And then he would do a little move. And then they would scream and scream and scream, you know. So he loved this idea. And he said... He said to me, we hadn't rehearsed it, but he said before the show, I'm going to do a private moment, Vince. I said, Mike, it's national TV. I don't know if that's a good idea, you know. He goes, I'm going to do it anyway. So he did. And I think it went on for like at least a minute. Now, a minute at the half bowl, uh, uh, at the Super Bowl halftime is like, I don't even know, a trillion fucking dollars or something. I have no idea. Yeah. But nobody stopped them. Nobody was going to stop them. We didn't do it in the rehearsal. We only did it in the shoot. Um, and I also got to play with the whole idea, with the whole idea of him cre creating all of those little children images with the flat, with the uh, the cardboard pieces that I had the audience, the Super Bowl fans uh, pick up, and that was fun. Um, he was so shocked. He didn't know about that part. I hadn't told him about that. And I had rehearsed with the whole, uh, all the people in the Super Bowl before Michael came out so that they practiced once. And then when Michael came out to rehearse it once, um, they, he did it and he was like, oh my God, this is going to be so much fun. So he had such a good time doing it. And that was, you know, he was a kid at heart and creating these wacky little moments for him, you know, it, I was just, happy to give him back some of the joy that he gave me you know that's incredible and ha other halftime shows well they're good and they're bad um some of them i like some of them i don't really care for that much um i thought that rihanna's last year was really good i really liked rihanna's work i thought i thought that was a really cool one madonna was iffy for me kind of was all right wasn't as good as I thought it could be. Um, Beyonce, I like Beyonce. She was interesting. But the most exciting thing is that we changed it. You know, I mean, we changed it. We made it happen. And, you know, it stopped being mar marching bands and little singing brats. And it turned, <laughs> I love children for real. I'm kidding. Um, but, you know, now it's what it is. And we changed that. And, you know, yeah. so. Now it's considered the crown. The now it's considered the crowning moment in an artist's career. It's like the pinnacle of like, oh, I'm aiming for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me about meeting Madonna for the first time. Madonna looked at me and said, I don't need a fucking choreographer and walked off. Thanks so much for listening. Stay tuned for our next episode. In the meantime, be sure to follow us on Instagram at 90sgay. Like, subscribe, follow, you know the drill. And we'll see you next time. Thanks so much.